In this video we're going to um, explore profit maximization. This is the super efficient model of the firm. Um, this is the one which is the bedrock of neoclassical economics and together with other super efficient models about consumer behavior and uh, the efficiency of markets and so on. Th this is what constitutes really the, the bedrock of what's known as neoclassical economics. The sort of economics that most people study at university, the type of economics that's found in most um, economics textbooks. Uh, the profit maximizing model is a theoretical construct. It's not necessarily one we'd fall across in practice. It's super efficient, but there are, there are other models that economists could use. They could talk about, instead of profit maximization, they could talk about growth maximization or sales maximization or growth of sales maximization or satisficing. And there are so many models around, but it just so happens this one is fundamental in a sense because this one tells us what the super efficient firm would do if the super efficient firm had the information to do it. Now, of course, therein lies the rub. Um, most managers <coughs> don't have anything like the information necessary to profit maximize. And if they did have the information, they probably wouldn't have the motivation to profit maximize. So it's unlikely that the, the managers would have that level of information to enable them to profit maximize. <coughs> and indeed, they may not even want to. Um, the model assumes that there is no uncertainty regarding market prices or indeed the internal structure of the firm. There's no uncertainty in the system. Everything is known absolutely. Absol everything is known with certainty. Um, so the managers know what the market prices are and they know what the internal cost structures are of the business, they know what the production system is, to know, to know everything about it. Everything is known with certainty. Of course that itself is very unrealistic. And it's also a static model which means it doesn't change over time. There are two types of models in, in economics, static and dynamic. Dynamic changes over time. Static models are fixed. And this model is fixed. It doesn't talk about changes to anything. It gives a picture of the firm as if that is the way the firm is, the company is, and that's the way it will remain presumably forever and ever. It doesn't, doesn't make a lot of sense in that sense. It's a static model. Not exactly the world we live in. Finally, <coughs> it's a rational model. By rational we mean it's a maximizing one. And maximization fits in with mathematics. Uh, there are many techniques in in mathematics to enable us to maximize. So it enables us to use mathematics. Uh, it's rational because maximizing behavior is the extreme form of behavior. Why stop short of that? What would happen in the extreme? Um, so it's, it's based on this idea of rational behavior, rational uh, thinking, rational uh, application of rules to certain situations to get maximum output. And it's based also on this idea of marginal calculations, marginal revenue and marginal costs, which of course most firms don't have any idea of where marginal revenue or marginal costs are, but that's a practical point. So it uses marginal calculations to, to generate our view of the firm. Um, it's only one model, as I said before, in the Economist toolbox. There are, there are many others. This is the most extreme one. And it could really be just viewed as a, as a benchmark. We could measure efficiency away from this one. This is the super efficient model. But as I keep emphasizing, it's not necessarily one we come across. And it's certainly not one the economists are naive enough to say, this is what applies in firms or, or should apply in firms. This is just simply a model from which we can start our analysis. It's the super efficient model in economics, super efficient model of the firm. Having said all of that, um, let's have a look at the model itself. Let's start with uh, a diagram. Let's say we have marginal costs and marginal revenue. 
<coughs> and there are videos on marginal costs and marginal revenue which you can have a look at. So let's say we've got these two curves here and let's say we produce one unit of output. Now you, as you can see the marginal cost exceeds the marginal revenue. In other words on that unit we are losing. Costs are in excess of, of revenue for that unit. If we only produce one unit we're losing. Now you can carry on doing that all the way across to this point where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. That's the break even point. It's break even for that unit. But if you look at the diagram, we've lost on the first one. Marginal cost is greater than marginal revenue on the first one. We've lost on the second one. Marginal cost is greater than marginal revenue. So we've lost on the first, we've lost on the second, we've lost on the third, and perhaps we've broken even on the fourth. So our, our accumulated losses rests, if I just put the cursor onto the diagram, our accumulated losses lies in this little, what looks like a triangle. Um, our accumulated losses lies in that space in there. We broke even on this particular one. We've lost on the one before, we lost on the one before, we lost on the So our accumulated losses are in this little area here. We break even on this one. In other words, <coughs> This little area, this little sort of shape here, this is the the total losses up to this point. The area of that shape is the total losses. If we'd carried on past the break even, you could see revenue exceeds cost, so we'd make a profit on the next one. Profit on the next one, a profit on the next one, a profit on the next one, and so on. Profit, 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 until we get across to here where we'd break even again. We break even on this unit, on this particular one. We've made a profit on all the previous ones, we break even on that one. If we produce one extra, we'd start losing. We'd lose on the next one because costs are greater than revenue. If we produce one less, profits. Uh, we're making revenue greater than costs, so we, we might as well take the profit off it. We would expand production until marginal cost equals marginal revenue. Well, let's have a look at the diagram again. This yellow area over here is our accumulated losses up to the break-even point, the point we break even on that unit. After that, we start to generate a profit. We generate a profit all the way down until we get to this break-even point, at which point profits are maximised here, losses are maximised at this point. There are two break-evens, there are two points in which marginal cost equals marginal revenue, here and here. So setting marginal cost equal to marginal revenue is not sufficient for profit maximisation because it picks up two points. This one here is the point of loss maximisation. We never talk about that, but it's there. And this one over here is the point of profit maximization. OK, let's see how profits behave then. Um, let's draw in total costs and total revenue. Total costs tend to be of that shape. <coughs> We've talked about that in, in other videos. Um, costs tend to rise and then cost into slacken off as the as diminishing returns eases up as as people become more skilled in production and more efficient eventually the companies get a bit too big outputs a bit too big costs start to rise again and and so on so we get this type of shape for our total cost and for our total revenue as output increases revenue increases at some stage we have to start cutting the price and as we cut the price total revenue starts to fall off. So you can see here we've got a break even here and a break even here. And if we draw out what happens to profits underneath, we get that shape there. This is break even, zero profits. That's zero profits. Losses are in here, so losses are building up up to some sort of maximum. Losses are zero here, break even. Then we go into profit, where revenue is greater than costs. 
So we're into profit and we continue in profit until we break even again after which we get losses. Okay, now let's use in total curves to generate a profit curve. And we can use that profit curve um, when we look at different theories of the firm. But in the meantime, sorry, I should say that we can just identify here profit maximization is somewhere about here, which is the maximum difference between those two lines, wherever that is. The maximum difference between them is our profit maximization. Uh, let's go to look at this in terms of averages and marginals. Well, <clears throat> just to keep it straightforward, we've got, first of all, we've got average cost and we've got marginal cost. Now remember, marginal cost cuts the average, there's the average, it cuts the average at this minimum point. It doesn't cut anywhere else, it just cuts at the minimum point. Mar marginal cost always cuts the average cost at its minimum point. And the average cost, we've drawn it as U-shaped because of the law of diminishing returns. As output expands, people become more efficient, workers become more efficient, more adept at producing whatever it is they're making. <coughs> There's greater use of machinery and greater use of efficiency. Um, the company is geared up to production. At some stage, workers get fatigued or <coughs> start getting in each other's way or there are inefficiencies in production that creep in and the average costs start to increase. So that's our average cost and that's our marginal cost. <clears throat> our average revenue is this straight line here, we'll assume. So it's an, if we say average revenue is a straight line, then marginal revenue has twice its gradient and it starts at the same point. You can see here <clears throat> from the diagram that there are two points where marginal cost is equal to marginal revenue, here and down here. So at the point A, marginal cost equals marginal revenue, and at the point C. Point B, by the way, is just a break-even point where average revenue equals average cost. So the company in total will be breaking even at B, and it will also be breaking even at D. But per unit, marginal cost and marginal revenue are equal at A and at C. So let's look at this again. Um, let's take the point C. Now let's take areas here. Let's take the total revenue for a start. This total revenue is equal to OC G E. OC G E. That's the total revenue. It's the quantity multiplied by the average revenue. So the area OC G E is the total revenue. That's the total revenue there. The total cost is O C H F. So it's the average cost here times the quantity, this quantity over here. So that is the total cost. And if we subtract this area O C H F from the original one, we're left with this yellow area here, which is our abnormal profits. Um, <coughs> normal profits are built into our average cost curve. Normal profits are what is necessary to keep the company in business, to keep the company producing. So, um, in our case, we have abnormal profits. Right, that's our view of the firm. That's profit maximization. Let's look ahead with um, a little table, just to make it practical. Um, here we've got six units of output. We've got marginal cost associated, marginal revenue, marginal profit. We don't often hear about this. This is a slightly unusual concept, but we'll talk about it, and total profit. Now, if the company produces one unit of output, the marginal cost will be 5. 
in other words the cost of making the one is five the revenue associated from selling it is 20 so the profit on the first unit is 15 20 minus 5 so the total profit is also 15 on the second we've got marginal is 7 marginal cost marginal revenue is 18 it's 7 minus 18 means we make 11 profit on the second one nothing to do with the first one on the second one we make 11 we've made 15 on the first one we've made 11 on the second one so in total we've made 26 on the third one marginal cost is 10 marginal revenue is 16 marginal profit therefore will be 6 16 minus 10 6 6 and 26 32 and on the fourth we get 14 marginal cost 14 marginal revenue 0 marginal profit so the pro total profit remains 32 that's the on the first and second one there are some notes on it um, now the profit maximizing output as you can see here just looking at the table starts at 15 26 32 32 25 8 so it's going up going up sort of going down going down here so it's going up to some sort of maximum and then going down so profit maximization is going to be somewhere between 3 and 4 if if we can have half units perhaps it might be in between three and a half or something of that nature so when profit uh, produces four units of output uh, there will be no profit associated with this uh, this unit so that the total profit remains constant at 32 when output increases from three to four units so in other words here we've got um, go back here for a second somewhere in here we can see that we've got um, somewhere between three and four is profit maximization now the selling price of the product must exceed the average variable cost of production if, if it's costing let's say five pounds to make something that's the raw materials, the labour, the electricity and so on. And if you're selling it for four pounds, don't make it. It's costing five, so don't sell it for four. So the the variable, the average variable cost must be met. <coughs> The selling price, if the selling price is less than the average total cost, but greater than the average variable cost, then the firm should continue in production since receiving a con because it's receiving a contribution towards the fixed cost. Let's look at the table here. Here we've got our little equation here. Average total cost is equal to average variable cost plus average fixed cost. Well, total cost is just variable cost plus fixed cost. So for the example. So average total cost is equal to 10, average variable cost equals 7, average fixed cost equals 3, and let's say the price is equal to 8. If the price is equal to 8, then it's greater than the average variable cost. So we're making a pound on each one, but we're not covering the average total cost. But we are making a contribution towards the fixed cost. If the firm closed down, because it's it's losing money here you can see average total cost is 10 <coughs> and we're only making 8 if it closed down it would not be um, it would lose the the 3 pounds on the on the fixed cost so as it is as it's producing at price equals 8 
and the average variable cost is only seven, it's making a pound towards the average fixed cost. It's making some contribution, so it's worth continuing in production. Um, as long as you're covering the average variable cost, it's worth continuing in production. Obviously, there is incentive to get out, if possible, get out of the business. But if you can't get out of the business, as long as you're covering the average variable cost, it's making a contribution. So why profit maximize? Well, if the entrepreneur is the owner and manager, then maximizing profit will maximize incomes. So it may be that the entrepreneur sees profit and income as the same, perhaps small business. So in a small business, there might, there might be profit maximizing. Um, there's a trade-off, however, because uh, the entrepreneur might have to work hard and spend a lot of time and effort to try and make the output. And that's a cost. There's a negative utility. There's a, there's a cost in this. Um, so you've got to find an optimal trade-off between the amount of effort you put in and the amount of profit you get. And that's the entrepreneur as a human being trying to balance his or her lifestyle. How much effort you put in versus how much do you take out. And that, of course, may not be the same as marginal revenue equals marginal cost. The two might be different. So there is a, there is a problem there. <coughs> Profit maximization, of course, may be forced on the entrepreneur by um, competitive pressure. It may be that you're in a market where it's highly competitive. In that case, you have to be super efficient. You have to watch every penny and adopt the most efficient methods of production and distribution. So it might be that firms are being pushed towards greater efficiency and profit maximization because of competitive pressure. Why should why should uh, people profit, uh, profit maximize in non-competitive markets? Well, if the market is non-competitive, if you happen to be lucky enough to be a monopolist, making lots of money, no competitors, you don't have to profit maximize. You could relax, take, take your money and don't do very much. Don't work very hard. So you don't have a lot of efficiency because of the um, the fact that you don't have competitive pressure. It could also be the case that the separation of ownership from control. This means <coughs> Separation of ownership and control means there are different parties in the fir in, in companies, in the firms. Um, companies are very complex organizations. But at one level we can just view it as the owners and the managers. Now that's one separation, separation of ownership from control. The owners, the shareholders, they want security of investment, they want high rates of growth in the firm, they want their share prices to rise. They want, they want to think that the, the firm is a good, reputable firm as well. So it's nice to be associated with it. On the other hand, the, the managers, they have different objectives. They want high salaries, company cars, long holidays, nice offices, and so on and so on. So we have a conflict between the two. And that's played out all the time. So it may be, if the managers are very strong, the company is not profit maximizing. It may be if the owners are very strong, they could put pressure on the managers. But it depends on the, the business, how big it is, and the power of each, each party, the managers or the shareholders. Finally, um, <coughs> it's really fair to say that most business people don't have any idea about uh, about marginal revenue or marginal cost in practice. Uh, they use rules of thumb. They, they, they set their price to see how it goes. They try to figure out if the price covers the variable cost and they're estimating all the time and they're, they're guessing. It's guesstimates. They don't really have the information necessary 
to equate marginal revenue and marginal cost. Not many business people know exactly how much it is to cost, uh, how much it costs to make a particular item. Not the one before it, not the one after it, that particular item. And if they don't have that information, they don't have the marginal cost. They can't sell each item at a different price in the market. They can't experiment in the market because they'll alienate the customers. So they don't have the information from the market to generate demand curves and marginal revenue curves. So this is an idealization. This model is it tells us in theory what the super efficient firm would be. But it's not necessarily a practical proposition. It's it's a construct. It helps us think about the firm and it's a benchmark from which we can launch off into different models which are less efficient, but perhaps more realistic. Okay, that I think is an overview of profit maximization. Thank you for watching.